sing his praises evermore. I'm only going over Jordan. Only going All right, this morning, open your Bibles up with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Imagine that. We were there in... in, in uh, chapter number two, please. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter number two, verses one through seven, we'll read, and then we'll have a moment of prayer. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. As the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, You have compassed this mountain long enough, turn you northward. And command thou the people, saying, You are to pass through the coast of your brethren of children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breadeth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Ye shall buy meat of them for money, and that ye may eat. And ye shall also buy water of them for money, that ye may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all thy works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, as we use your word. Lord God, your word was given as commands. You've given these things as, uh, for a, a definite purpose for us. May we find this purpose this morning as we, as we take to our hearts. And your Holy Spirit feeds us through your Holy Word. Father God, we just thank you tonight. Thank you today uh, for all of the blessings, all that you provided to us, each and every one of us, in different ways. We pray today, Lord God, that we might be an honor and we might be a blessing to you as well. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, good, good. So, so. The Lord here has a plan for every one of his children this morning. He's got a plan for me, a plan for you. Uh, the moment he saved you, the moment he saved you, he, he had a plan for you. He actually had a plan for you before you were even, even born. When he, when, he, when, he, when he wrote your book down, your name in that book of life, before you were ever born, he had a plan for you then. And now he wants, as we come to a saving knowledge of Christ, he wants to see that plan come through fruition. So the Lord has that plan for every one of his children. You ever tell somebody, you ever tell one of your kids, listen, or you ever tell somebody you've had, uh, I, I try to give a little respite to my brothers in blue when they're here, so, I, I, so I'm going to pick on Matt for a second. You ever had to tell somebody on a call, enough is enough. <laughs> Every day, right? Every day. Enough is enough, okay? Had enough of this. Enough is enough. So, so we've, we've told our children enough is enough. And, and uh, uh, it, it's time to get moving, right? It's time to move along. Enough is enough. It's time to get going in your life. Enough is enough. Um, you've been sedentary too long. Enough is enough. So we're, we're all familiar with that. And as a born-again child of God, if you're here this morning and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Lord, the Lord God might be telling you in your life, enough is enough. It's time to get moving. And, and, and he's told me that on several occasions in my spiritual life uh, because there's two prevalent ruts that you and I get into as a child of God. We have a danger of getting into two ruts that are very prevalent. Rut number one is this. Standing still, yep. sitting still, standing and sitting still on the gift of our salvation, the gift. And I say it's a gift. You know, the greatest gift I ever had in my, in my lifetime was when the Lord saved me. Amen, church? Amen. It's a, you can't, there's, that gift cannot be outdone. They cannot be outdone because it comes with such a future, so many promises uh, that, are going to be, that are going to be true. 
Can't be outdone. But sitting on the gift of our salvation, not moving for the Lord. That's rut number one. That The moment you get saved, it's a very dangerous rut. You're headed there unless you, you do the right things for the Lord. Um, that all translates in just not serving him. I got saved. I'm a one and done person. There I am. I'm not going to do anything else for the Lord. Or what I do, it's going to be what I want to do and not the way he wants it done. We just had a whole Sunday school lesson about backsliding. Uh, I, I'm sorry you missed it, but you can catch it on YouTube at some point. The second, the second dangerous rut, moving impatiently, not waiting on the Lord or his ways or seeking his guidance as a born-again believer, but moving impatiently through life, not seeking his will, but following our own will. That's the second dangerous rut we get into as saved individuals. Well, the Lord calls us his people. He called the nation of Israel his people. Um, they rejected him. Hence, we get the benefit. Amen. That's kind of the way I tell that story. So the Lord's edict to his people, but the edict that he gave to his people here is no different than the edict he gives to you and I in the New Testament church age. If we take a look at verse number three, he says, ye have compassed this mountain, what? Long enough. enough. Long enough. You've compassed this mountain long enough that he says to his children. And, and compassing this mountain is not my will for you. So, so I would like to think this morning that our mountaintop experience was the day we got saved. Amen, church? I, I can't get a better mountaintop experience than that on the face of this earth. No, there's nothing that can give me a better mountaintop experience. But you see, I believe just as though then, now the Lord is the same way. He doesn't want me to compass that mountain for my entire saved life. Just sit there on that mountain and with a mountain of salvation and don't do anything with it. He wants me, enough is enough. It's time to move along. As he says, you have compassed this mountain long enough. You've been wondering the time's come to cease. Where you're currently at in your spiritual life, where you're currently at um, in your life, the Lord is going to tell these people, I'm not giving you so much as one foot to camp out in. Look what he says in verse number five. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breadeth. I won't give you one foot to stand on there or to set in. But rather, what does he say in the second part of verse number three? Turn you northward. He gave them a command. Turn you northward. See, when the Lord takes us out of the wilderness wandering, and that's what every one of us were in when we got, before we got saved, weren't we? We were just wandering around through the world trying to figure out how to make it. Um, we were wandering through with no salvation, with no direction from the Lord. When the Lord takes us out of that wilderness wandering, it, it's a mountain of blessing to be saved. We get to, he sets us on that salvation mountain momentarily, but he expects us to move beyond that in our lives. And it can be said of so many of God's people, you've compassed that mountain long enough. Do something now. Go north, right? Go north. But understand God's command here in verse number three. When he's, he says, go north, how do you and I go north? Isn't that going north? We just push this little chin upward, and we, we stop looking at the flat ground. We stop looking at, you know, what's over here and what's over there in the world, and we start doing this, the spiritual will of God for our lives is for us to do the same thing. We've compassed mountains in our life long enough. It's time to go north. Time to look north and start doing things that way uh, in our lives as well. <clears throat> Northward. Look to the promised land. That's what he was telling them. What's my promised land today? Heaven. What's your promised land? I hope it's heaven. heaven. Yeah, because if it's not, and, and, and if you can't get there, we're going to give you an opportunity to get there at the invitation. Amen. 
northward, look towards the promised land. And for you and I that know Christ as our Savior, that is looking up. Looking up. You see, it's the stiff neck that are not able to go like this. Instead, they're looking at the values. They're looking at the ways of the world they're, while they're proclaiming their salvation. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. Hold your spot there in Deuteronomy and go with me to Colossians chapter number 3. <clears throat> you know, if, 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 if I'm a man that says, yeah, I'm saved. I know the Lord saved me. There's no doubt about it. I know that. Well, if I'm a man that says that, or if you're a man or a woman that says that in your life, then, then there's probably mountains in your life that you can pass long enough. And it's time to look up. And when we see in Colossians chapter number 3, in the New Testament, God is not any different here in his word. We see in verse number 3, he says, If you then be risen with Christ. What's the, what's, what's the stipulation? If. If. He said, who is he talking to? If ye then be risen with Christ. He's talking to people who have, been, who have died with Christ, was buried with Christ, and has now in their life has been resurrected with Christ. If you then be risen with Christ, what does he say, church? Seek those things which are where? Above, where God setteth on the right hand of God. Man, how can you do that? How can you do that? Can you do it by, you know, uh, 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 you know, kicking hubcaps at the car dealership? Is that seeking it? Is that, is that really seeking it? Uh, is that, uh, can you do it by getting the best computer system or a new phone? Uh, is that doing it? No, none of those things. None of those things. It, can, you, can you do it by uh, getting a better job? And, uh, no, none of those things. None of those things. See, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. How do you do it? He tells us in verse number two, set your what? Affection. 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 <laughs> I better not say that. I get myself in trouble. Uh, your affection. Don't anybody twist this out of context on me, okay? There's a lot of ladies in my life that I like very much. But my affection is set right there. Right there. Right there. Notice I'm not even going to be a wise guy. It's hurting, but... I know. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. What? Not on the things of the earth. We are so guilty, aren't we, church? We're so guilty on setting our affection. It's okay to like kicking the wheels on the car. It's okay liking the, the, the newest computer. It's okay liking, uh, you know, a nice new phone. It's okay liking all those guitars. <laughs> it's okay liking those things, but don't set your affection on them. You see? Okay, I use an illustration. There's a lot of ladies in my life that I like. But when my affection is set on that one, which one always comes first? Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That, that should knock the Mormons out of business right there. How can you have two wives? Could you imagine, could you imagine having two of her? <laughs> okay.
We have to understand that God's command is that we look up. For you were dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Yeah. There's a lot of people forgetting to sit down in that seat and to take that direction today. Many, many people. Uh, there's a movement. We have to have movement for the Lord. You know, in, 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 do I want to take you there? Yeah, I'll take you there. Philippians chapter number three. Just back up a book. You'll be in good shape. Philippians chapter number three. Verse number 14. Apostle Paul told this to the church at Colossae. He says, in verse number 14, he says, I press toward the mark for the what? The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, that's, you see, he's not compassing some mountain and just sitting there. He's pressing toward the mark. What is the mark? The mark is the prize. Uh, the, the mark is the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he's pressing toward. Um, so he's looking up, giving us that illustration to look up. Look up. You know, God's people back there in Deuteronomy had compassed this mountain long enough. And I ask God's children today that are sitting in the sound of my voice as your pastor, what of this world have you compassed long enough? What have you just been in a routine, in a rut, doing each and every day of your life that's all of earthly value and it has no spiritual good to you? It has no, and it and it's all comes before the Lord and you don't have the time for the Lord and you're just sitting there compassing that mountain. He's giving you a great mountain of salvation. He wants you to stop compassing that mountain. He wants you to go do something with it now. He wants you to do something with it. And that, by the way, that do something with it isn't on your menu. It's on his, and it all starts right here. So make no mistake about that. So what ground are you standing on, and, and it's become so comfortable to you? And you're not pressing towards the mark of the high calling. Again. Jesus saved me. When Jesus saved you, he didn't take you away. There was a reason he didn't take you away. There's a reason he didn't take you to heaven. Because he had work for you to do. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And listen, the work he had for you to do isn't to go to college. The work that he had for you to do isn't to go to work. The work that he had to do for you isn't to get uh, a nicer car. The work that he had to do for you isn't to, to, um, to date until you find somebody to marry. The work that... No. The work that he had to do for you is serving him first. First. That's the work that he had to do for you. And then he'll bless you with all those other things. We studied this morning in Sunday school. If we do it any other way, we've lifted our heart, haven't we? Lifting our heart becomes pride. Becomes pride. He doesn't favor that well very well. So the Lord has blessed us. He's blessed us through our wilderness wanderings. He's brought us to a mountain of called salvation in our life. He's set us on the mountaintop. Yes, we're going to go through valleys. We all will, and we'll continue to do that. But understand this of God and his people. Now, let me take you back to Deuteronomy, uh, where we started in that text, chapter number 2. Verse number seven of that chapter says that for the Lord thy God had done what? He blessed us. Didn't he bless us? He blessed us. This morning in Sunday school class, so this will be a little continuance of that. I used reference as I made my notes and the Lord just laid it on my heart to use Ray and Suzanne as an illustration. They put in the most beautiful garden. It's plentiful. It just produces all kind of good stuff, church. But, but it will never sustain them. They'll still have to go to the store. They'll still have to buy something. You're going to go home after church or wherever you're going to go. You may go out to eat. You may go home. But, but whatever, there's going to be food within your reach. You're going to be able to eat. You're going to be able to be fed. You're going to be able to get full. You're going to be able to do all those kind of things. Listen, if, you know, we had a little meager garden. They have this big, 
grand, wonderful garden that they, they work really, really hard in. But it'll never, it'll never put them in a position that they don't have to go to the store. And for those of you who don't have gardens, you didn't put anything up, you, you have the, we have the blessings of living day by day. Amen. We have blessings of God. Where's this food come from? Oh, I, I buy it at the grocery store. Yeah. Well, who, who helped supply it to the grocery store? And you see, you see all the things because of the blessings of God on this nation and on my life I get to take for granted? Hmm? Amen? What would you do if all the stores closed tomorrow? What would you do? There's this new term in, there's new, this new term in our economy right now. Food insecurity. A new term. Food insecurity. Which one of God's people go home today with food insecurity? I'm not. I'm not. But if they closed all the stores tomorrow, you people would be in a panic. Because you don't have stuff set up on the shelf downstairs that you grew to sustain you or get you through for a short period of time till stores open up again. Imagine being in Ukraine. Hmm? Imagine being in Gaza. Just, to, just to, any of those places. What am I going to do for food tomorrow? We don't have that problem, do we? We are blessed people. That's just one simple illustration. You're going to go home, and Lord willing, you're going to click, 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 click on a light switch. It's going to, the light's going to come on. Wherever you go, the thermostat works. They're going to have heat. They've got a furnace wherever you go. There's people right now around this world that are freezing in this cold. They're freezing in this cold. And they're freezing for a few reasons, different reasons. Maybe one, they refuse long enough to seek to seek the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. And these things are not being added unto them. And they've hardened their hearts. And God has totally made sure they're not getting blessed with anything. Bad place to be. There's people in bad shape all over this world. For the Lord God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. The Lord God has allowed me. He's equipped me. He's given me the gifts and the talents to do what I do. They didn't come from me. They came from above. He knoweth thy walking through the great Wilderness. Well, the first part of this verse, the bless thee in all thy works of thy hand, he's found favor in his people, hasn't he? Yes. He's found favor in his people. And I want you to leave here today with the mindset that God has found favor in you. That's why you're going to go home and you're blessed. You're blessed because he's found favor in you. And I want you also to understand his wisdom in the second part of this verse. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. We're still, even though we're saved, church, we're still in a great wilderness because we're just passing through this joint. Absolutely. Right? My home's in heaven. Your home's in heaven. That's the new address change. So we're just passing through. This is a wilderness for us. But as we pass through the wilderness... We need to understand his wisdom. He knoweth. That's his wisdom. He is mindful of us. He knows the way we take. That should be very concerning to us, that he knows the way that we take, walking through this great wilderness. We need to understand his presence. These 40 years, the Lord thy God had been with thee, he tells his people. 
these 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the Lord thy God has been with you. These 69 years, the Lord my God has been with me. Even when I was stupid. Yeah, especially. You're right, Sister Kim. <clears throat> Understand his presence. Do you have evidence in your life? Do you have evidence in the past in your life that the Lord has been with you? Come back on Sunday night and you hear some of that evidence through testimony time when we come back to glorify Christ. Understand the sufficiency of God in the last part of this verse. The sufficiency of God. God has been with thee. Thou has lacked nothing. 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 See, this is the end of the year. It's the Christmas season. It's when things get a little bit warm and fuzzy. So I'm giving you a little extra kick today before warm, warm and fuzzy time. Church, I want us to get it. I want us to get it. I want church to stop being looked at as some religious obligation and I'm one and done. Do you hear me, church, with an amen? Do you hear me? If you don't hear me or don't want to hear me, don't say amen. I want the members of this church, of the New Testament Baptist Church, as we go to close out this year of 2024, I want you to get it. I want you to stop looking at your spiritual life, your salvation, and just sitting on that mountain of salvation. I want you to get it. I want you to get God wants you to do this. And if you won't do this, all you're going to look at are things of the world. It's pretty simply put. Okay? I want to see your faces. And I want your heart and your spirit and your souls to be here on Sunday morning. I want to see you get involved. I want you to do away with the attitude of one and done. I've done my religious obligation. If you're saved and you haven't followed in obedience to the Lord in baptism, I want to see you getting baptized. That would be non-members. If you're a member of this church, I don't want you to follow Satan's urging to tuck and run when the pastor puts pressure on you. I want you to do it. We have a communion service next week. I expect to see every member here. And I'm saying this to establish this with the Lord. Every word is established when I say that. You believe that? <coughs> you notice I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Your place is to be here to observe the Lord's Supper. If you're a member of this church. Your place is to be here to observe the ordinance of baptism. If you are a member of this church. Cut the apathy. Stop being so apathetic. And another thing. We offer Sunday school. Stop the religious one and done obligation. Be here. Be here. Because you know when you stand at the Bema Seat judgment, if you're saved, the Lord's going to tell you. What did the pastor tell you? What did he tell you? Why didn't you believe him? See, the devil says, you talk like that, you're going to be down to 25 people. Yeah, but it'd be the strongest 25 people in the town. We are either compassed around some mountain in our life because we're lost or we're just not caring and putting God first. Amen? We need to change that. 
and only we can change that individually. You know, the Apostle Paul said it in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that ye may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. That's our obligation that's made personal. As we prepare to close, turn to Luke chapter 22 with me. And I'm going to tell you right now through this whole message, there's some of you sitting here today that, that the, say, the, the, the spirit of the Antichrist is telling you something. The spirit of the Antichrist is telling you the pastor just doesn't understand. He just doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that you, you've got to do this. And you've got to do that. And, and, and there's just no time. No, that pastor understands very well. There's 168 hours in the week. And you all got the same amount I do. And you all have the same as each other does. Why is it that some can put the Lord first and others can't with 168 hours in their week? It's because they don't want to. And they put themselves first. That's the only answer. I'm going to ask Brother Adolph to come and prepare to lead us in the closing invitation hymn. As we look at Luke chapter 22, let me direct your attention to verse number 35. And he said unto them, this is Jesus, he says, when I sent you without purse, you weren't carrying a bunch of goods, you weren't carrying money, and script, and shoes, lacked ye anything? What did they answer, church? They said nothing. It got all of their needs got provided for them when they followed the Lord's command when He sent them. There's not a one of you here that can that can truthfully name the name of Christ that you have not been given orders to be sent. Not a one of you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you think. I don't care how much you don't like to hear this. I'm telling you. The truth, amen? The truth, the truth. If we're a Christian, we need to be Christ-like. Verse 36, Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script, and he that had no sword, let him sell his garment, and buy one. I got a sword in my hand right here. I got a sword in my hand right here. But it's sharper than any two-edged sword. This one is. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it hurts. It hurts. I don't believe anybody here today could say, Pastor, this message doesn't hurt. It don't hurt. It's supposed to hurt. That's why God gave it to us. He uses us to put us where we need to be. When lightning strikes, it does that to put balance back in the atmosphere. That's why it does it. But oftentimes there's damage as a result of that. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing an invitation hymn. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Lord and you, don't suffer, you, don't, you don't get any of these blessings. 202. But if you do, this may be a day you need to rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and come out of that shell, come out of that hiding, and step forward and pray. When's the last time that a Christian, as a Christian, you ever took a trip to the altar?
This may be the day you need to do that. You come, whatever the need is, we won't tarry. We're gonna sing two verses a song, and then we're gonna close. 200.